So the discourse around the live-action Disney remakes trend has mostly been dominated by how many of them are either so similar as to feel pointless or if different at all, only in terms of minor details to address so-called plot holes or politically dated story points, that it's easy to forget that one of the most successful, if also most divisively reviewed at the time, was the first Maleficent, which solved the problem of Sleeping Beauty's villain being more interesting and memorable than any of the good guys in that story by making her the main character. You know, and also turning the story into a gonzo alt-history retake on the material where by the villainous was actually a wronged woman with extremely sympathetic motivation. Witchcraft was the new agey, neo-pagan, earth magic good guy side, while humanity was more or less the industrializing villains a la Avatar. The king was a scumbag villain, Prince Charming was a dumbass who didn't actually really do anything and got dragged around and moved into place by the female stars. The real love story turned out to be a surrogate mother-daughter one between Maleficent and Aurora. And oh yeah, the actual narrative reframed the whole thing as the Disney version of I Spit on Your Grave, i.e. a militant feminist rape revenge fantasy. Seven hundred fifty-eight million worldwide box office gross later. What? Really? E even with all the, and people were still surprised by the blonde that shot rainbows at people. Okay. The Mistress of Evil is back to find out why the sequel is called that now that she's clearly the hero. That's not even a joke, that's basically the plot. Despite having saved two kingdoms, killed the evil king, rescinded the curse, avenged herself, turned out to be on the side of good, and installed human foster daughter Aurora as the human queen of the fairy populated moor, somehow the traditional story of Sleeping Beauty that spread across the neighboring kingdoms between films still positions Maleficent as the villain, and she's kinda hacked off about it. Plus, Prince Charming, or Philip, is still hanging around with eyes on the kid, and she doesn't hate him, but she doesn't like him either. Now, it's kinda tempting to call this character regression, so that Maleficent can still be bad and fun, but I kind of dig that an ostensible family movie is willing to admit getting justice against the one person who screwed you over isn't gonna magically fix your psychosis. But anyway, Philip and Aurora want to marry and bring peace between the human kingdom and the Moors, which is tense because there's a fairy poaching situation going on, and Maleficent has big suspicions about that, that she'll now have to work on tamping down a little while meeting Philip's royal family, which is, unsurprisingly, or there'd be no movie, going to go disastrously wrong largely thanks to antagonism by our new villain for the piece, Michelle Pfeiffer, as Philip's not-so-secretly wicked queen mother. Yes, having defeated the patriarchy in the first film, and evidently subtle allegory in the development process, Maleficent's nemesis this time around is effectively internalized misogyny, here personified by Michelle Pfeiffer as an alabaster empress with a literal allergy to flowers and fairy dust who seethes from the sidelines at her peace-seeking war-averse husband and son, builds a private fairy genocide army in secret, fondles her collection of swords, spears, and crossbows with fetishistic envy, and keeps Jen Murray's diminutive, icy yet doe-eyed androgyne psychopath Gerda cowed and on hand as a personal pit bull. Like I said, not subtle. Now believe it or not, this is the business that's in the trailer and really only covers a longish first act, which closes out with one of the would-be principal characters cursed, Sleeping Beauty style, and Maleficent framed for the be cursing and having to get the hell out of Dodge, after which, well, I'm not really sure if the revelations and new stuff that crops up and forms the bulk of the second and third act of the film is necessarily spoiler territory, so much as nifty new stuff they didn't really market yet, but suffice it to say, once the everyone thinks Maleficent is the bad guy again plot point drops into place, everything takes a hard left turn into a big expansion of the narrative, geography, mythos, lore, scope, and a big info dump of new business about what Maleficent actually is, and a literal whole new world's worth of characters and concepts to be played around with, and feels a bit like the mouse saying, if everything has to be a universe, fine, figure out how to make five or six other places for this to go too, just in case, but mainly provides for a big multi-tier action-heavy act three for everyone who wanted more of the monster stuff out of the first one, and also serves to throw a bone to the various characters who took the brunt of the only Maleficent gets to be useful gags in the original. Now, obviously, this could never be as much of a, where the hell did this come from, and how did even Jolie convince Disney to release it, shocker, as the original? Mistress 
Fortress of Evil is still barely even halfway into its own bug nuts depths before one has to concede that take it or leave it, love it or hate it, this is without a doubt Disney's most gloriously weird franchise, a female-led, wickedly subversive dark fairy tale with a Frazetta does hot topic high fantasy aesthetic, dominated occasionally in the most suggestive sense possible by Jolie, flashing that blinding vampire smile of ivory fangs and blood-red lips as the ultimate 21st century goth goddess. And she is indeed still the star of the show, even if, like the first film, Maleficent is often off-screen for longer stretches of time than the title character would otherwise be expected to be. It's one of the unusual but compelling things about how this property has been designed. Other than when she's facing off some sort of directly proportional threat, Maleficent is more of an observing presence or Greek chorus in her own story rather than a central active player unless she opts to be, which helps to keep her appropriately mysterious but also makes sense in a narrative context of a severely traumatized character who almost never gets close to others. And that's good because it lets the supporting cast breathe and develop and it turns out there's a lot of supporting cast in this, but less so if there isn't anything to develop and it's a bit disappointing considering how much of a spectacularly hate-worthy bastard Shrouto Copley got to play as the villain in the first one that even though Pfeiffer is allowed to invest the queen with a lot of subtext, like a lot. The actual text as to why she's doing bad guy stuff turns out to be kind of a letdown, or maybe they just figured, well, it's not like we can go darker than the mutilation by metaphor rapist guy, so maybe we can just take a whole other tack this time. I don't know, this won't be everyone's cup of tea, but the first one turned out to be a lot more people's cup of tea than anyone expected, and honestly, I didn't really get it the first time, but then I saw it again and I wondered how I missed all that, and I'm not sure this one really holds up as much, but it's ambitious as hell, everyone is acting their ass is off, Jolie is beaming in from another goddamn planet. And all the talk about how big movies in general, and this studio in particular, doesn't specifically take enough chances or make any different risky stuff, even when they've got a property like this that they know is going to turn a profit no matter what, you can't really say that this is one of those. Someone is swinging for the fences here. And uh, once again, this time without needing to see it twice, I really dug it. 7 out of 10? Okay, now bring Gargoyles and Black Cauldron back, you're so into the spooky stuff.